Thank you very much, Moritz. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce um, John Reed, who's come from Sydney, Australia, to speak to us about ultrasound and imaging of soft tissues of the groin. Okay, well, um, as everybody else has been saying, it truly is a great honour to be invited to speak here at this wonderful meeting. Um, I'm going to talk on ultrasound and uh, in the interest of time I'm going to cone down this talk to chronic or long-standing groin pain rather than um, acute causes of pain. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is actually talk about uh, just these more uh, central structures uh, of the symphysis pubis, its capsule and the surrounding parasymphysial tendons and uh, just a little bit about the inguinal canal. Firstly, when I use ultrasound, I don't use it in isolation. I always use it, in fact, in combination with both plain X-ray and generally with MRI. And I think there is good reason for this. Each of these tests have individual uh, advantages and weaknesses and they are complementary to one another. The particular strengths of ultrasound, in my opinion, are uh, the assessment of tendinopathy and tendon lesions, particularly at the abdominal end, which is a weakness of MRI, uh, and the assessment of the inguinal canal, um, symphysis pubis I think is better done by MRI but nonetheless we see changes routinely on, MRI, on ultrasound with regard to this uh, structure and the other strength of ultrasound is that it is a clinical test it is con you are there with the patient um, correlating the, the symptoms the points of tenderness and this gives it a particular power of defining relevance of, of an imaging finding. The transducer I used to do this uh, is um, a centre frequency, it's a broadband transducer, but centre frequency 7 or 7.5 megahertz. So if I begin with the symphysis pubis and we look at the uh, general orientation of this structure, you can see on an MRI coronal and sagittal plane here that the uh, symphysis angles uh, posteriorly as we go inferiorly by a variable degree but um, generally around 45 degrees or so. What this means for ultrasound is that the more anterior structures, the superior structures and the anterior, let's say the upper two thirds of this construct are well visualised by ultrasound but the deeper portions here that are becoming more vertical to the skin surface, more vertical to the, uh, to the beam, are poorly resolved. So we don't see well the arcuate ligament, uh, but we do see well the anterior pubic ligament. Now, the anterior pubic ligament is a very thick structure. You see it over here in this uh, anatomical drawing a very thick structure and has, has, has been mentioned earlier today, it is a layered structure and we do in fact routinely resolve these layers on both ultrasound and MRI. Uh, okay. On MRI, sagittally here, notice this hypo, slightly hyper-intense zone within the anterior pubic ligament. This is a very important structure which I'll come back to uh, uh, soon. But if we now look at the ultrasound uh, equivalent of this uh, in two transverse sections here in a young patient, firstly at the pubic crest level and then a little bit further down at say mid, mid symphysis pubis level, you see the appearance of a normal anterior pubic ligament. It's a very and the normal ligament is a very uniform echogenic structure. It has a very thin black line here at the, at the ligament bone interface, which is the fibrocartilaginous zone of transition, which uh, all entheses have. Notice as well as we come down uh, 
lower on the, on, on the joint that we start to see the pubic apophyses on both sides, normal appearances. Looking at the pubic apophysis, which uh, is resolved routinely on both MRI and ultrasound in athletes, often into their late 20s, uh, because these individuals under high loading stress tend to have delayed maturation, delayed closure of their physis. But the normal apophysis you'll see is uh, it lies at the anteromedial corner of each pubic bone. It's a unique structure because it actually uh, enters the joint at one end. But the normal apophysis is fairly symmetric in size and has, uh, again, fairly uniform uh, symmetrically sized physial plates. Now, returning to this uh, structure that um, I was talking about, this zone of altered signal that we do resolve routinely on proton density weighted MRI at, uh, within the central substance of the anterior pubic ligament. If we take this coronal plane of section down through that zone, this is, what it, this is what it looks like. And this zone of altered central signal is that middle layer of the anterior pubic ligament. It is a critically important mechanical structure because it forms a central hub of force transmission that links both uh, structures on the ipsilateral and contralateral side, trunk to lower limb. So on the corresponding... Uh, cadaveric dissection here, you can see this same central zone which I like to call the pubic plate but into this inserts multiple structures. It has been called in the imaging literature the rectus abdominis adductor of ponurosis but not only is that a very large mouthful to get out it doesn't quite adequately grasp the full uh, level of connection of this structure because into it inserts pyramidalis, rectus abdominis, conjoint tendon, inguinal ligament, adductor, um, uh, gracilis has fibres that also link to this and there's a cord of fascia lata from the thigh which attaches at it. Um, so it's a very, very important structure and we routinely resolve it on ultrasound as well. It is a subtle structure in the normal uh, young patient but becomes increasingly more conspicuous as we age because it undergoes a myxoid degenerative um, change as we get older. Now, this is shown here on this. If we look at these central images on MRI, this is a, a 51-year-old patient with degenerative change occurring in this uh, central zone. So you see this high signal zone in the thick anterior pubic ligament the deep, thin, dark layer here could be notionally regarded as the true capsule of the symphysis pubis. Um, uh, it's also, the extent of it is also well shown on, uh, on these images on the right, which are a 34-year-old uh, patient who was at 34 weeks gestation. So in pregnancy, these ligaments... Uh, their water content massively increases and uh, you can see in this, if I had an arrow it would be good, but this, uh, the joint space has opened up here in this pregnant patient and you can see that the same zone, this central zone of the anterior ligament, what I call the pubic plate, is uh, swollen and diffusely hyperintense but you can now see the full extent of it. On ultrasound, in the adolescent uh, prior, uh, in the early teens, because that central zone sits adjacent to unossified cartilage of, of uh, the pubic apophysis, it looks echogenic relative to the cartilage. But as we get older, uh, it takes the other, other appearance and it becomes more hypoechoic relative to adjacent um, normal ligamentous structure. So just to show you now some examples of pathology that we see on ultrasound in this construct. So the first thing is degenerative change and uh, we do see normal age-related degeneration uh, at the symphysis uh, at relatively young ages but 
in the athlete it is accelerated and, uh, and the first changes occur in the central disc, the interpubic cartilaginous disc so the disc becomes more hypoechoic, it bulges a little bit and of course we see cortical irregularity at the adjacent attachment. And in this other example of only a 27 year old there's, there's a wide uh, primary cleft with gas bubbles, these bright echoes sitting in a fluid zone. Now, a very common finding in the, in the athlete with chronic groin pain is a tear. Um, this is the sonographic equivalent of the secondary cleft that you've been seeing already today on MRI. But we see these routinely on ultrasound as well. And with, armed with that knowledge that the normal anterior pubic ligament should be uniformly echogenic, now when you see these dark lines that extend from the central joint line and out into the pubic plate, this line here, these are tears. They are by definition tears because they are extension of fluid across a structure that is no longer intact at that point. Um, the other thing to say about these, by the way, is that when the tears are small, uh, you don't see macroscopic shift in the, at the symphysis pubis on flamingo stress views, but when if the tears are large enough, you start to see these uh, macroscopic um, shifts that we, we can call a frank instability of the joint. But even at that level below this, where the tears are small, these tears represent a partial defunctioning of the passive stabilising mechanism of the symphysis pubis and they predispose to micro instability. And you can imagine that an athlete loading this joint with abrupt high, high level forces is causing abrupt tugging on all of the adjacent parasymphysial tendons in the presence of a micro-unstable joint. Um, other changes that we can see not uncommonly on ultrasound, so here is uh, a chronically stressed pubic apophysis. In fact, this one's separated because when you look at the x-ray you can see there's a little bit of displacement but, but a widened uh, physeal plate and out of that plate comes a line, an echogenic line these are tears extending into the capsule from the physeal plate and they often go out on MRI to the, uh, uh, to the, to the uh, far edge, lateral edge of the capsule and produce edema, characteristically edema in a ductor brevis. Um, here's another example of that. This one's not a avulsed but it is separated. It's, if you can catch the meaning, it's not displaced but it is separated. So here we have a normal physis. You, you see a slight little dimple here, but no, separa uh, no separation. On the other side, this is a chronically stressed physis which is wide and it has a line which comes out with capsular uh, alteration and echogenicity around it. Uh, and, you know, and we see the same thing on the MRI. We see a widened physis and we see this very thin high signal line which is uh, a separation of the plate. Uh, when we see these lines that come out of the uh, out of the joint space, or communicate with the joint space, but run intimate in intimate association with the anterior surface of the pubic bone, these are um, uh, these are again tears, but they are involving the capsule. They are capsuloperiosteal stripping injuries or peelback type tears and in my mind mechanically they infer an episode of subluxation, mild subluxation uh, or a macro event either, either way. Um, and here is an example, uh, Damien asked earlier today about the uh, superior cleft and whether that communicated and whether it was the same entity and I believe it is. Here's an example of that. Uh, uh, a capsular strip uh, which uh, destabilises the joint and, um, and these are the sonograph, this is the same patient, these lines that are coming out of the joint are the capsular strip. Uh, so I am way over time. I think I might stop or... Sorry? Did I? Okay. Um, 
The abdominal tendons are a particular strength of ultrasound and a distinct weakness of MRI. MRI sees some of these but misses most, particularly in the chronic groin setting, chronic groin pain setting. Just to return briefly to the anatomy that was uh, discussed earlier today, these are a series of uh, coronal uh, fat suppressed proton density weighted images which run from anterior to posterior. And if we move from the pyramidalis muscles anteriorly to step back into these uh, black cords, you'll see these black cords here. These are the tendons deep to pyramidalis which form a sheet that come down and fuse with the pubic plate and or the pubic bones. These are uh, linear, oh, linear alba, uh, rectus abdominis tendon and this lateral cord is a very important one. This lateral cord is the conjoint tendon and I call it the conjoint tendon uh, with the reservation that the anatomy is not really purely just uh, transversus abdominis and internal oblique structure. It actually, this is a combination of uh, rectus sheath, uh, a portion of rectus abdominis tendon as well. It's all a confluent uh, construct. But for want of a better term, I call this the conjoint tendon. And the, uh, when you as clinicians elicit tenderness over the pubic tubercle in a patient with abdominal uh, predominantly abdominal pain, this is the pain generator. This is the thing that on ultrasound is routinely tender and abnormal. Uh, this patient, by the way, has uh, a normal right conjoint tendon, but if you look at the left one, there's, it, is, uh, it is high signal and the adjacent rectus abdominis is also abnormal, as is adductor longus. Now, these things are all interlinked and it is, if you look at MRI plus ultrasound together in these chronic groin patients, virtually none of them have an isolated uh, lesion. They are always abnormal at both the abdominal end and the, and the lower limb end. So even when the patient has purely pain at the abdominal end or purely pain clinically at the adductor end, on imaging we see pathology at both ends of that construct and it's only logical because they are intimately connected mechanically. Um, looking at this anatomy again in a transverse... Am I out of time now? I'll, st I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs>